Hi there, I welcome you to this fourth lecture on the lecture series on physics of external beam radiotherapy. In this lecture, we will look at isodose lines, isodose charts, and also the corrections to be applied to these isodose charts for obtaining total dose distribution for patient geometry or patient contour. We will also look at calculation for irregular fields using Claxon integration or sector integral method. Isodose curves or charts are obtained by measurement in water phantom. Usually the dose at depth is the greatest on the central axis of the beam. For example, if you measure the dose at the central axis of the beam, the dose will be the maximum at central axis and it gradually decreases as you go off axis. Except for an exemption where you have horns in the case of high energy photon beams due to the flattening filter. We will discuss that later, but at the moment the, we will see the dose at the central axis is higher than the dose at the off axis region and it decreases as you go away from the central axis. Near the edges of the beam, that is the penumbral region, the dose decreases rapidly as a function of lateral distance from the beam axis. So when you go near the edges of the beam, that is the penumbra region, the dose rate decreases rapidly as a function of the lateral distance from the beam axis. So here you can see a steep fall off of dose and it goes like this. Isodose charts or curves are represented by lines connecting equal dose points. It is used to represent a planar or volumetric variation in absorbed dose. Isodose curves are lines passing through points of equal doses. For example, if you look at here, let us say here you have 90% and you want to get 90% isodose line. To obtain that, you have to find out where all you have 90% in this grid. This is a calculation grid and you have doses at each points of the grid. To get 90%, find out where it is closer to 90%. For example, here it is 95 in this point and 83 in this point and you take the average of it, you get 90 somewhere here, right? So you keep connecting these points and you get 90% isodose line. Similarly, you can do that for some other percentage like 50% by taking the value of 50% in this grid by interpolation and then connect all those points to get the 50% line. Here is the one for 30% where you get determine the 30% values in the grid and connect them to get 30% isodose line. So isodose chart for a beam consists of a family of isodose curves as you can see here usually drawn at equal increments of percentage depth dose. I said this is 90%, this is 50% and this is 30%. You can have more lines here. This is done as a function of depth and transverse distance from the central axis. So as you go down the depth, the dose decreases and as you go in the transverse axis also, the dose decreases. So it is a function of depth as well as the transverse axis. Here is a typical isodose chart for a 10 by 10 beam. As you can see, this is the central axis and the dose at the off axis is denoted by these lines. If you do a cross-sectional view and look at, you will get the dose distribution like this. I have drawn only 90%. If you go to 100%, you will see it somewhere here. And these are 80 to 10% lines. For obtaining isodose lines and charts, you should have a water phantom like this in which the ion chamber can be moved in x, y and z direction remotely for measurement of depth dose and beam profiles. It should also have an ion chamber for reference here. For isodose lines, you need to have measurement of percentage depth dose and beam profiles. While measuring the percentage depth dose, the ion chamber should be positioned at the effective point of measurement. For LENAC, you need a reference chamber and the ratio of the measurement chamber and the reference chamber is usually plotted for depth dose and the beam profiles. The beam profile should be measured at Dmax 5, 10, 20 and 30 centimeters. The present day treatment planning systems use this percentage depth dose and the beam profiles to model and obtain the dose distribution. There are some older methods of doing isodose lines or drawing isodose line. 
and those are called decrement line method and the fan line method. This is the depth dose curve that we usually get at the central axis and these are the profiles done at various depths for example d max 5, 10, 20 and 30 centimeter. In the decrement line method or fan line method you take the central axis as 1 and then take the ratio and see where it is 0.9 that is 90% of the central axis and do the same thing for the second profile, third profile and fourth and the fifth profile and join these lines. This line is called 90% decrement line or 0.9 decrement line. Similarly, you can do 0.8 decrement line, 0.7 decrement line, again on this side 0 0.9, 0 0.7 side, 0 0.7 and go on like this. Once you have this decrement line, you can connect the points of equal doses as I showed you in one of the previous slides to get the isodose line. When we were discussing about the beam profile, I said the dose is maximum at the central axis and you go off axis it decreases but exception being the horns in the linear accelerator. I would like to explain what these horns are. These horns are created by the flattening filter used in the linear to flatten the beam. As you can see here, you see those horns and this is usually the flattening filter is designed to overcompensate near the surface in order to obtain flat isodose curves at a greater depth. So at the surface it overcompensates which means the central axis dose is less than the off axis dose resulting in these horns. But when you go to a greater depth you feel it it's almost flat you don't see the horns. The same thing could also be seen in the isodose charts. The effect of the horns here at the central axis the dose here is less compared to the off axis point. Next I am going to talk to you about wedges, mainly the physical wedge or you can call it hard wedge. Soft wedges are also available nowadays, most of the people use soft wedges and the vendors have given different names for the soft wedges like dynamic wedge, virtual wedge, motorized wedge etc. However, physical wedges are also still being used with cobalt units even with linear accelerators. When you introduce a physical wedge in the path of the beam, there is attenuation of radiation by the wedge. but on the thicker side of the wedge there is more attenuation and thinner side of the wedge there is less attenuation thus the isodose line is tilted to an angle. Normally when you buy physical wedges they provide you four different common wedge angles 15 degree, 30 degree, 45 degree and 60 degree. The wedge angle is the angle to which this isodose line is tilted from the normal but this tilt varies with the depth. So the question is at what depth you should take the tilt and measure as the wedge angle. There are two different definitions. Olden days the wedge angle is the angle to which the 50% isodose line is tilted from the normal. Currently we take the angle subtended by the isodose line at 10 cm depth with the line perpendicular to the central axis. So this is the line perpendicular to the central axis which I call the normal earlier and this is the angle subtended called the wedge angle. If this is 15 degrees then you call the wedge as 15 degree wedge. If it is 30 you call it 30 degree wedge. The attenuation by the wedge at the central axis is referred to as the wedge factor. We discussed this in detail in the previous class but this is what this attenuation is what at the central axis is what is referred to as the wedge factor. Wedge angle is a function of field size and depth as I said as you go down the depth the wedge angle will change but what you use as the reference wedge angle is either at 50% isodose line or the isodose line at 10 cm depth. The wedge when you make has an angle. This angle is called the angle of the wedge that will bring in a tilt in the isodose line here. So you shouldn't get confused with the angle of the wedge and the wedge angle. Wedge angle is what is important for us in our treatment planning. In the olden days with cobalt unit they were making wedges for various field sizes but later they understood it is enough to make one large field size probably 15 by 20 centimeter and use it for smaller field sizes. This has been referred to as the universal physical wedge. 
That is, you have a wedge as large as this, but if your field size is smaller, but you still produce the same wedge angle. The angle of the wedge is same and the wedge angle would nearly be the same, uh, except that there is an extra attenuation. If you are making for a smaller field size, probably this wedge would have been enough. But now you are using a larger wedge like this, which brings in little extra attenuation, but the wedge angle would be the same. So this wedge, which has been made for a larger field size, can be used for a smaller field size as well as for a large field size. This has been referred to as the universal physical wedge. These are two representative isodoses when you introduce wedge. When you introduce a wedge in the path of the beam, the isodose curves get tilted. As you saw in the previous one, the profiles got tilted. Now, if you create an isodose chart, the isodose lines will be tilted. You will have more dose on the side of thinner edge and you will have less dose on the side of thicker edge. This is for a 30 degree wedge and this is for a 60 degree wedge. There are two types of wedge isodoses. These ones, what you see here, are called normalized wedge, which means when you introduce a wedge, the dose in the central axis as well as in the off axis will decrease. The dose at Dmax probably would become 70, uh, 70 instead of 100. That is because wedge attenuates, the dose becomes less at the central axis. And if you use the isodose chart as it is, for your calculation, you should not apply the wedge factor correction in the output, in the dose rate, because already the attenuation by wedge is in the isodose. Here what you see is the isodose curves have been normalized, that is the 70 has now been converted to 100. This is a normalized wedge. If you use a normalized wedge, then you have to correct for the wedge factor in the output. So please remember. If you are using a normalized wedge, please correct the output for the wedge factor. If you are using unnormalized wedge, you should not correct the output for the wedge factor. What you see here on this side are the four wedges normally provided along with the linear accelerator 15 degree to 60 degree, 15, 30, 45 and 60. This is the side view of it where you can see the wedge uh, angle angle of the wedge I would say, angle of the wedge and this is the side. Why do you need wedges? What are the uses of wedges? Wedges are used to compensate for the missing tissue. It reduces the high dose areas or the hot spots in dose distribution. There also you can use wedges, mainly used for as a compensator for missing tissue. For example, you look at the dose distribution with a single isodose a single beam isodose. You see there is less attenuation because of the air here and there is more attenuation at this area because of the tissue. Because there is lack of tissue here, the isodose as you can see is tilted towards this direction. It actually looks like you have thin edge of the wedge here. Right? Now I can introduce a wedge in the path of the thing where the thicker edge where you have lack of tissue and thinner edge where you have more tissue. I can actually shift the isodose from here to the opposite direction, this side. Actually I used a 60 degree wedge here, so it got tilted here. Suppose if I use a 45 degree wedge, I can make this isodose line very close to straight line. In case I couldn't do that, neither with 60 nor with 45, for example, with 60 it goes towards this direction. When I use 45, it goes towards this direction. I need something in between 45 and 60. How do I do it? because I am given only 45 degree and 60 degree. What we can do is you can use partial treatment with 45 degree or 60 degree and partial treatment without that. Right? Then you can get any shape of the isodose as per your requirement. So this is one way of solving problems for intermediate wedge angles. Here is another example for use of wedges in treatment planning. Let us take this case where there is a significant curvature in the patient body and there is lack of tissue here and there is excess tissue here. In case you have a direct beam here, you will have more dose on this side as you can see here due to the lack of tissue or deficit in tissue and you have isodoses being taken towards the surface because of excess tissue in this area. In order to compensate for this, you can have a wedge in this place. 
as you can see in this picture. The thick edge of the wedge is in the place where there is deficit in tissue and thin edge is there where there is excess tissue. So, the thin edge will produce more dose and compensate for the attenuation by the excess tissue and thick edge will reduce the dose and compensate for excess enhancement of dose or excess dose due to the deficit in tissue. So, when I have a wedge here, you can see the isodoses which were earlier dipping like this has now been taken up. However, if you see the tumor volume which is in red, this isodose is not properly covering the tumor volume. There is significant gradient in the isodose lines. Therefore, I would like to add another beam laterally at 90 degree to it as you can see in this and I will have a wedge for it. This arrangement is called perpendicular wedges and in this perpendicular wedge if you can see the thick edges should meet. Now I get a better distribution as you can see here which is more uniform and covering the tumor volume. What should be the angle of the wedge theta in this case? How do you select what should be the angle of the wedge? Present day with the computer programs, you can try various methods or trial and error and get the best wedge angle that is most suitable for this plan. But olden days when we were doing manually, we had an equation where the wedge angle theta is given by 90 minus pi by 2 where pi is referred to as the hinge angle. Hinge angle is the angle between these two beams that is this is the hinge angle. In this case the hinge angle is 90 so 90 minus 90 by 2 which will come to 45. So the wedge angle has to be 45. I may not agree with us that 45 is the best but when we were when we were doing manual planning, this was the best method of getting the correct or more appropriate wedge angle. Present day with computer program, you can do a lot of trial and error and come out with the best wedge angle that is suitable for this treatment plan. Though there are several advantages in using wedges, there are also some issues in using physical wedges. Number one, you know very well, it attenuates the beam. When it attenuates the beam, the output or the dose rate at the point of insert it decreases which means the treatment time will have to be increased. Secondly, we use high energy x-rays. We know very well x-rays are polychromatic and these physical wedges will attenuate the low energy component of the x-rays thus making the x-ray a hardened beam. The beam will now be hardened by the wedge material. Therefore, the percentage will depth dose will change and you need to measure and use the percentage depth dose for each of the wedges. Right? The third one is there is a limitation in the field size. Maximum field size that you could get with wedges nowadays is 15 by 20. And also if you have let me say three beams in a plan and each beam you are using a different wedge angle, one will have to enter the room to change the wedges, physical wedges for each beam. This will increase your treatment time and the wedges are heavy to handle. Next we would see how you can get total dose distribution for a particular plan. Let me say this is the patient outline, the contour and this is the tumor that you need to treat with the radiation. If you put just an open beam here and look at the dose distribution, you get something like this. And if you do a lateral beam like this, you get a dose distribution like this. What you can do is you can have the lateral and the anterior and then sum the dose distribution, you will get a distribution like this. Still it is not a uniform dose distribution, I, you could see significant amount of variation within the tumor volume. What you can now do is to have one more beam from the other lateral side so that you can have dose distribution that just goes around the tumor volume. However, there are other issues here, you will have more dose on the surface here because of the greater depth. So you should look at various permutation combination, maybe you may be able to have one beam from this side, one beam in this direction rather than having a lateral beam but you need to have more information about the critical organ scan. So people would normally use an CT 
image and do the planning on the CT image so you know what are the critical organs involved and you also know the density of each of the structure and density correction will be you will be able to provide right so this is actually obtaining total dose distribution which we were doing manually those days presently with the computer you can try various permutation combination of beams to arrive at the best dose distribution for the treating the particular tumor in the previous slides we learnt about obtaining total dose distribution in the patient body contour or cross-sectional CT images. When you obtain the total dose distribution, there are some corrections to be applied. What are those corrections and how do we apply those corrections? Number one, when you did the calibration of your LENAC, that is when you obtain the beam profiles and the percentage depth dose, you used a phantom which had a very plain surface and the phantom had a uniform density material in it. However, when you go on to apply those data onto the patient, the patient body is not a plain surface, it is either curved or irregular surface. The other issue is you may not always have a direct beam as you can see here, you may be having an oblique beam. Therefore, there will be some missing tissue in the path of the beam as you can see here or excess tissue in the path of the beam. The second thing is you use the phantom which had a uniform density and here the patient body has different densities so there will be differential attenuation of the radiation in the patient body and you need to correct for that. How do we apply these two corrections? One for the contour, second for the heterogeneity in the patient body. First we will look at how the correction for the body contour is applied. There are different methods for applying the correction for contour irregularities. One is called effective SSD method. The other one is tissue air ratio method. The third one which is simply done and used for manual method is called the isodose shift method. Let us look at the first method for contour correction which is the effective SSD method. Assume a surface SS yes, which is highly irregular and curved surface. If a beam central axis meets the surface at a point Q and you are interested to know the percentage depth dose at a point A which is at a depth D from the surface, the dose at the point A is given by that equation 1 where DA that is the dose at point A is D dash max multiplied by percentage depth dose P dash where D dash max is the dose at D max at Q dash. Let us say the tissue deficit or tissue lack of tissue at above the point A is H. Now if you move the surface S2 dash S2 dash to S dash S dash by the distance H assuming it does not change the PDD because of large SSD and a small H, the dose at point A is now given by D max dose multiplied by the corrected percentage depth dose. If you take this equation 1 and 2, divide one by the other, you get the corrected percentage depth, depth dose P corrected is equal to D dash max by D max into the original percentage depth, depth dose P dash. D dash max by D max is the change in the dose due to inverse square law. And this is given by the formula D dash max by D max is equal to SSD plus DM divided by SSD plus H plus DM whole square. If you substitute this D dash max by D max in the equation 3, you get the corrected percentage depth dose is equal to SSD plus DM divided by SSD plus H plus DM whole square into original percentage depth dose. So this is how you apply the correction for percentage depth dose by the effective SSD method. Let us look at the second method which is the tissue ratio method for contour correction. This can also be called a tissue maximum ratio method because for high energies we use tissue maximum ratio rather than tissue ratio. This method is based on the principle that the tissue ratio or tissue maximum ratio does not change with the SSD and it is only a function of depth and the field size. 
Let us look at the same contour SS which is very highly irregular and curved and the beam central axis meets this contour at the point Q dash. If you are interested to know the percentage depth dose at a point A which is at a depth D from the surface and there is a tissue deficit H above this, let us assume for the time being we fill up this S2 dash, S2 dash up to S dash, S dash with tissue and place an isodose chart at this level of S2 dash, S2 dash, you can note the percentage depth dose at this point A. But this percentage depth dose is not for the depth D, it is for the depth D plus H. However, there is no attenuation in H. In order to correct for this, we can take the ratio of tissue ratio for depth D for field size R divided by tissue ratio for depth D plus H for the field size R. And if this factor which is the correction factor, tissue ratio correction factor is applied on to the percentage depth dose, you get the corrected percentage depth dose for the tissue deficient H. The third method for correction of air gap is the isodose shift method. This method is mainly useful for manual drawing of isodoses. We don't use this for computer based calculations. Here people have estimated what should be the shift given for a tissue deficit or excess tissue for various energies. For example, if there is a tissue deficit of let me say H here, you multiply this H by a factor K right, and apply that shift to the percentage depth dose at this point and move the percentage depth dose by that point down. For example, up to 1 MV you have to use a factor of 0.8. For cobalt 60 a factor of 0.7 and you multiply H by 0.7 and move the isodose at this point by that factor. You don't multiply the isodose value by that factor, you multiply the amount of deficit in tissue or excess tissue by that factor and move the isodose by that distance. So this is isodose shift method. It is for manual drawing of isodose shift and only for academic reasons I have put it here. One other method to avoid surface correction is to use tissue compensators. Tissue compensators for the machine tissue is made to the same shape but one has to take the divergence into account and because it is kept at the shadow tray level and the size of the compensator will have to be accounted for for the position of the shadow tree. The second correction you will have to apply depends on the type of material that you use. Linear attenuation correction will have to be given for the material to the shape and the size of the machine tissue or the height of the machine tissue. So you have to provide correction for the linear attenuation coefficient and make the size and shape equivalent to that. Currently tissue compensator ma making machines are available which though expensive can make accurate 3D compensators. When one does a total dose distribution in a patient geometry or patient image, I said two corrections will have to be applied mainly. One is for the contour, shape and curvature. The second one is for the tissue inhomogeneity. When we did the measurement of percentage depth dose and beam profiles in a phantom, it was a unit density or a uniform density phantom. The patient is not of uniform density. You have bone which has higher density like 1.6 or lung which has a lower density of 0.3. One has to apply correction for this heterogeneities in the patient body. Do we really have to correct for tissue inhomogeneities when you do dose distribution? There is an increase in dose in tissue beyond the healthy lung. For example, for ortho voltage be beyond the lung you get an increase in dose by 10%, for cobalt 60 an increase of 4% beyond the lung and for 4 MV x-rays it's about 3%, 10 MV is 2% and 20 MV is x-rays is 1%. So there is an increase in dose beyond the lung because of the lower lung density. 
If you don't do the correction for it, the dose beyond the lung will be higher by 4% and higher by 10% in the case of ortho voltage and higher by 4% in the case of cobalt 60 comma S. Similarly, if you take bone, beyond the hard bone of 1 cm, there is a decrease in dose of 15% for 1 mm copper HVL X-rays and about 7% decrease in dose for 3 mm copper HVL X-rays and 3.5% decrease for cobalt 60 gamma rays and 3% decrease for 4 mv X-rays and 10% sorry 2% decrease for 10 mv X-rays. If you don't do the correction, the dose will actually be less by 3.5% or 3% for X-rays and gamma rays, high energy X-rays and gamma rays which could considerably affect our dose distribution. The enhancement in dose due to the presence of lung tissue and decrease in dose due to the presence of bone tissue that we discussed in the previous slides are taken from the book. In order to check what really happens, I did a small experiment with our treatment planning system for a true beam data and I would like to show you the differences when we have a heterogeneity bone heterogeneity and lung heterogeneity in the path of the beam. Here at the depth of 5 cm from the surface, I have 4 cm of bone. Here at the same point at the depth of 5 cm from the surface, I have 4 cm of tissue equivalent to lung density. I did it for both 6 mv as well as 10 mv. You can see that there is a small dip in dose that is happening in the case of bone and there is an enhancement of dose that is happening in the case of lung. We will see it a little more clearly, clearly with the percentage depth dose. Let us now look at some of the data that I generated with the phantom that I showed you in the previous slide. I did for both 6 MB as well as for 10 MB with bone heterogeneity first. If you look at that, I had a 4 cm bone as I said earlier at the point of 5 cm from the surface and this is the 4 cm bone. You can see there are two percentage depth dose curves. One is red which is a homogeneous tissue, no heterogeneity there. It is taken as unit density material and I generated the percentage depth dose graph. And then I introduced that bone heterogeneity and generated the percentage depth dose graph which is given in green. I want to explain you two things with this. One is if I go and look at a point after the heterogeneity, let me say at 10 centimeter depth, the dose with no heterogeneity is about 66.8 percent and when the heterogeneity is introduced, it comes to about 61 percent, which is approximately there is a 6 percent reduction in the dose because of bone. When I go to 10 mv at the same point of 10 centimeter, there is a reduction of 4.5 percent. That is when there is no heterogeneity, it is 73.7. When bone heterogeneity is introduced, it comes to about 69.2 or something. There is approximately 4.5 percentage decrease in dose with bone heterogeneity in 10 MB. The other interesting point I would like to show from this graph is when the radiation enters from a low density tissue to a high density bone, you can see there is a buildup that is happening. This is actually the bone interface where there is an increase in dose. This calculation was done with Acros, but if you do with Monte Carlo, you would get the exact value here. Similarly, when it goes from bone to tissue, the inverse of it will happen. Again with 10 MV, you see the same effect happening when the radiation enters from tissue to bone, there is an increase in dose and again there is a decrease and slight increase when it enters from bone to tissue. If you look at my data with lung heterogeneity, you see the same effect in the depth dose curve but in the opposite direction. The red depth dose curve as I said in the previous slide is for unit density material, no heterogeneity here. The green one is with the 4 cm heterogeneity at the point of 5 cm depth, 4 cm heterogeneity of lung, lung tissue. 
you can see if you go to 10 centimeter depth again and see there is an increase in dose the increase is from 66.5 percent to 71.8 percent approximately 5.5 percent increase for 6 mvb if you look note the same at the same point of 10 centimeter depth with a 10 mv beam there is an increase from 73.5 percent to 78.3 percent approximately 4.8 percent increase because of the lung tissue prior to this point you can also note the same difference at the interface that is now the radiation is entering from high density to low density then from low density to high density and there will be an interface effect here again there will be an interface effect because it enters from low density to high density there will be an increase in dose at the interface what we discussed in the previous slide was calculated with the help of an advanced algorithm called across xb algorithm we will discuss all the advanced algorithms in our advanced level course on external beam radiotherapy now i am going to talk to you about inhomogeneity correction methods originally introduced or suggested there were three methods suggested based on tissue ratio we can also use tissue maximum ratio because for high energies we don't use tissue ratio these methods are called tissue ratio method power law tissue ratio method and equivalent tissue ratio method let us now look at the tissue inhomogeneity correction methods one by one the first method is the tissue air ratio method or tissue maximum ratio method this is the simplest of all methods and could be used even for hand calculation of tissue inhomogeneity correction let us look at this picture now for high energy photon beams where Compton interaction is predominant the attenuation of radiation by different materials of different density is mainly governed by the electron density that is the number of electrons per cc if you have a heterogeneity like this you can get the equivalent depth or effective depth by converting to water equivalent depth let us look at this particular example where there is a heterogeneity rho of density rho at a depth of d1 in water which has a density of 1 and the thickness of the heterogeneity let me say is d, d2 and you are interested to know the dose at a point p which is at a depth d3 in unit density medium now this is the only non unit density medium having a density rho for a thickness d2 the physical depth of this point p from the surface is d1 plus d2 plus d3 which i denote as d therefore the tissue maximum ratio if you don't have an heterogeneity region in this point a tissue maximum ratio at p will be given by tar for the depth d and for the field size rd however now you have a heterogeneity medium of thickness d2 with density rho therefore you can now calculate water equivalent depth or you can call it effective depth we call it equivalent path length also for the radiation beam the equivalent path length or the effective depth will be d1 plus d2 into density plus d3 so this is d dash this is the water equivalent depth not the depth d the water equivalent depth of the point p which is d dash is equal to d1 plus rho into d plus d3 you can say you are multiplying d1 and d3 also with the density but the density there is 1 now take the tissue ratio for this which is ta or d dash or d the ratio of these two will provide you the correction factor to know the exact dose at this point this method does not take into account the position of the inhomogeneity relative to the point p so whether you go lower down or you go up the correction factor would not be very different because it doesn't take the take into account the position the distance from the heterogeneity or inhomogeneity medium to that point let us look at the next 
method for tissue in homogeneity correction that is the power law method. This was proposed by Batho, Yang and Gaylord. The ratio of TIR is raised to a power rho into e power minus 1. As you can see in this equation for correction factor, the thickness of the heterogeneity or inhomogeneity that is D2 is taken into account and the position of P where you want to know the dose with relative to the inhomogeneity is also taken care of that is the D3. Therefore, the correction factor depends on the location of the inhomogeneity related to the point but not related to the surface because the D1 is not taken care of here. It is also based on the theoretical consideration assuming Compton interaction only. That is, you assume it is very high energy photons and only Compton interaction is possible. It does not apply to points inside the inhomogeneity or even in the build up region. So, this is useful for points outside the inhomogeneity, not for the points inside the inhomogeneity. Since the previous equation suggested by Batho, Yang and Gaylord was not suitable for points inside the heterogeneity, a general form of equation for correction factor was provided by Sontang and Cunningham that allows for correction factor for points inside as well as the, for the points that are outside the inhomogeneity. So, the equation takes care of the density of the medium in which the point P lies as well as the density of the heterogeneity that is rho 2 as well as rho 3. In case the point P lies in a unit density medium, then the equation will reduce to the previous equation. Next method is the equivalent tissue ratio method. This is similar to the ratio of tissue ratio method which was first discussed. But in that ratio of tissue ratio method, the primary component was calculated accurately but the change in the scattered dose is not predicted properly, is not predicted correctly. This is because the effect of scattering structure depends on the geometric arrangement with respect to the point P. So, how does the scatter reach the point P depends on the geometric arrangement. Therefore, Sontang and Cunningham accounted for these geometric factors through the scaling of the field size parameters. They gave a different equation for this row. The row that you use in your scaling, they, the calculation of the row had to be done by taking the sum and average of the densities of the scattering element. That is, rho ijk is the relative electron density of the scatter elements and wijk or its weights calculated using Compton scatter cross section and integrating scatter over the entire irradiated volume for each point of those calculation. For each pixel or each point, they calculated the scatter in contribution by Compton scatter correction and gave weightage for each point and then they summed it. It is actually an integration of the row over that and take an average of it finally. And this row was utilized that took into account the scattered dose in addition to the primary component. Another alternative approach to the equivalent tissue ratio method is to calculate the scattered dose separately from the primary dose by summation of scatter contribution from individual scatter elements in the irradiated heterogeneous volume. This method is known as the differential scatter ratio method. There are more advanced computer based methods such as delta volume, dose spread array, differential pencil beam methods all been proposed. These methods take into account multiple scattering of photons and electron transport to predict dose more accurately as well as in regions where electronic equilibrium does not exist. So, there are much more sophisticated algorithms have come but we had to discuss those to understand how the algorithms got evolved from the basic tissue ratio method to what we use the advanced algorithm. Before we conclude this lecture, I would like to talk to you about the sector integral or Claxon's method to determine a dose at a point for a very highly irregular field. This has nothing to do with heterogeneity correction, but this is for calculation of an irregular field. Right? 
For example, let me say you have an irregular field like this. This is a typical mantle field used to those days where lung blocks have been used here to shield the lung. In case you want to know the dose at this point P, how do you get the dose at this point P? You need to have you know, either TMR or tissue ratio there, depending on the energy you are using. So, but there are significant lack of scatter due to the shielding of lungs and also irregular shape. You know, it is not a square like this. So there is lack of scatter here, lack of scatter here, lack of scatter here and lack of scatter here. Let us look at how you do this. Let us take one ray. What we do is we divide this into number of rays. Let me say every 10 degree you take a radius and you will get 36 radii around. Let me show you one radii, how do I do it? For example, if I take this radii one, I will find out what is the scatter ray ratio for this. And again for two, I will find out what is the scatter ray ratio or scatter maximum ratio for this. But if in this case, the scatter maximum ratio will be different. I can't take the, for this radius. For example, let me say this radius is 15 centimeters. Some about three, four centimeters, you didn't have any scatter. So I cannot take the entire length. I have to account for the lack of scatter here. I will show you with this much more uh, longer ray where you have more uh, non-scattering medium or less scattering medium to be correct. For example, you take the point P and the radius normally would be P to E. Okay. So what you do is you take the radius P to E and find its scatter a ratio which is a C A or P E and then find the distance P to D and subtract that from this which means you now get the scatter only from this area. Then you add P to scatter ratio or scatter maximum ratio for P to C. You add that and then subtract P to B which means now you get the scatter from here added to the scatter from here. Then you add the scatter from P to A, scatter maximum ratio from P to A. So it will be SAR PE minus PD plus PC minus PB plus PA will give you the total scatter as per the scatter from here and you subtract the one from here and add the one from here and subtract the one from here and add the one from here. You need to do this for every ray. Right? If the ray doesn't have any non-scattering area, then you don't need to worry about it. You just take the ray and find the scatter. But if it has a non-scattering area, you have to subtract. So in this case, what I would do is I will take from P to this point and then P to this point, subtract that and then add from this point to here. So I get the scatter from here and the scatter from here and, and then get the mean scatter error ratio, right? which I call the average scatter error ratio. Then add it to tissue ratio for zero field. You get the total tissue ratio or tissue maximum ratio. So the scatter contribution for irregular field determined by summing of SAR for various angles and then taking the average is referred to as the sector integral. Right? So this is how we will do if you have an irregular field. Thank you very much for listening to this. These are some of the references that you can look at. As usual, please do the assignment for this fourth lecture. And if you, when you complete the assignment for all the four lectures, you can download your certificate of completion.